Hey everyone, welcome to the show. We're still waiting on Jared to show up. Ooh, hang on, I'm gonna hit the... Thanks, Dada. Um, my name is Jamie Higginbotham. I'm currently joined by by Ryan... Ryan, I can never say your last name. Katen? Katen? Yes. Yeah. Katen. Katen. I, you know, I always feel, I always seem to get it right the first time, and then I never think it's right. Yeah. Um, no. We were. I was going to have you start with Falcon Heavy and uh, Starship stuff, but since I can't talk about that, and I feel like it'd be really weird for me just to like, to, like do this just part, <laughs> part way through. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with um, me me misspelling Boeing in the title <clears throat> to yeah. Bowen uh, and talking about um, you know Starliner is currently one point one. Th this was an article in Ars Technica, I believe. I s believe it was Eric Berger. Boeing has now lost 1.1 billion, with a B, dollars on Starliner. Mostly because it's not, well, I say this, but I feel like it's because it's not a cost plus contract. And I'm not sure Boeing knows how to do aerospace that isn't cost plus? Question mark? I mean, maybe, maybe not. Uh, in, in a lot of this is just the, the extended delays with, with Starliner. Like, think about this. Back in the day... When NASA was announcing this program, right? The, the, what was this? CC Dev? Um, they, Boeing was the preferred favorite. Everyone thought they were going to launch first. And certainly this is not a race, right? Like, we want to make sure that everything is safe. Like, you, you don't, you don't race to space. I say that, but Apollo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I guess, I guess space has always been a race, hasn't it? Okay, well, maybe you shouldn't. You want to do it safely, right? And um, it was like there was little doubt in anyone's minds that Boeing was going to make it first. And in fact, they got an extra several billion dollars for schedule assurance. That schedule assurance, let's just be clear here. Yeah. SpaceX is about to launch its seven opera operational mission and eighth overall crew mission, operational crew mission. Right? So seven operational crew missions to station, eight total crew missions, because there was also a demonstration mission two that sent crew up there, mm -hmm. for NASA in the amount of time that Boeing has sent goose egg. Yeah. So I guess my question for the, the chat room and for just kind of like opening up the floor is, is there a point in time that we think that Boeing is just going to nope out and be like, you know what? Because it's... It's not a cost plus contract. I believe, no, you know, Boeing gets paid on milestones, right? So they reach a certain milestone, they get a payment. They reach another milestone, they get a payment. And so Boeing is set to get a pretty large payment when they send humans to the International Space Station. But there is a cost, you know, risk reward analysis that you can do here. And you could say, you know, it's going to cost us so much more at this point to actually make this thing operational. Let's just kill the program. I, I don't know the contract. I don't know if they're allowed, but like, is there a possibility where Boeing's going to nope out of this thing? They've already lost $1.1 billion. And actually, the, the whole overall department, hey, I took a note of this somewhere. Um, yeah, Boeing's Defense, Space, and Security Program reported a loss of 527. We're just going to call this, they reported a loss of half a billion dollars for quarter two this year. That's <laughs> just this quarter. <laughs> if they if they continue that, assuming that Q one was the same, like if they if they if we extrapolate that out to all quarters, that is two billion dollars in loss just for Boeing's defense, space, and security operations program, right? Like, there's got to be a point where you where you nope out and you just go, eh, I'm not going to do this anymore. And that's by the way, that I'm sorry to keep just going, but like that's. Like, we also have to consider, like, there were these late-breaking issues with Starliner, right? There were the soft mm -hmm. links on the lines that connect the parachutes. I <laughs> Actually, this was... When was this? This was, like, early June, something like that. I've lost track of time. I'm sorry. Um, but, like, this was not that long ago. Like, a month, two months ago, they found these issues with the, the links and the parachutes. But then they also found that P213 glass... I'm sorry. It was um, uh, cloth tape uh, that they had wrapped things around that was flammable. And <laughs> it's like... You, like they were on the verge of launching this thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. But what are I the mean, ramif how? what are the ramifications of them not fulfilling the ends their terms of the contract? Do they have to give that money back? Great question. So you know what? And I regret getting rid of the data bubble that we had in the member show. We had a little data bubble that we could put in between the two of us. So it's just this floating head that shows up like right over here. And I wish we could have done that. Anyhow, um, 
I do, no, I don't believe they have to give any money back because they did technically meet the milestones in which they were paid, right? So it's not like, so they won't get the money for making it to space, space station until they make it to space station. Um, but then on the way to space station, it's like, okay, NASA says, all right, well, you need to prove that you can fire your abort engines, right? And then, you know, show us that you've got a safe abort system. And then, you know, Boeing or SpaceX or whomever would do that. And then NASA would go, cool, here's $100 million. Thank you for doing that. And they go, okay, now we need, we need you to prove that you've got, you know, good life support systems on board. And so then, you know, they'd send it up into space with no humans on board. They prove good life support. They go, cool, here's a half billion dollars. Thank you for doing that. And they've done those milestones. So like that's money in the bank that they would be able to keep, I would assume. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know the contract. I'm making wild assumptions here. So keep that in mind. But, you know, they have not made the money for sending humans to space station or the operational contract of this vehicle, right? So it's not just like, hey, they make the space station, they get one check. Then it's every time they make it to space station, they get a check for that. So they could look at this and go, no, 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 the upside is far greater than the downside. We're going to make way more. And I think someone in the chat room earlier wrote, like, it's it's got, you know, a potential $8 billion upside. But that's $8 billion revenue, not profit. Keep that in mind, right? So mm -hmm. they're already $1.1 in the hole. There's a tipping point here, Right. Like, also Jared, a wild Jared has joined the room. <laughs> Hi, Jared. Good to see you. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good, actually, good wherever you are to everybody. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it's, it's evening for uh, Ryan. So, uh, Jared, I don't know how much of this you caught. So, basically, I'm discussing like how far do we think Boeing is going to go with Starliner? <laughs> like they have. By the way, for the record, they have given no indications that they are going to cancel this program. I'm just looking at this, and I'm looking at this from from a like a business bend of like you know would i keep this thing going maybe maybe but like i don't know it's starting to lose a lot of money yeah they are losing a lot of money but also i feel like boeing kind of has no choice um with their you know commercial crew services that they have to offer um so they're gonna try to do everything they can to get other people to want to do it that's why they're trying to work with um, Amazon with Orbital Reef and and just basically, I would imagine trying to shop Starliner wherever they can to whoever they can and see if they can get some people that want to fly their astronauts or payloads on board of it, possibly. Um, but Wait, I, has, that, has that been I successful, do, though? What's up? Has that been successful? Like, have people actually gone, yeah, this is a thing we want to do? Has that been... Have they been able to show a financially viable product here? Um, I don't think so. Uh, but I also don't feel like Boeing is going to uh, allow Starliner to fail um, in, in their own eyes. They, with, with recent problems that they've had with things like the 737 MAX and other stuff, they're looking for a comeback. And as far as they're concerned, it doesn't matter whether Starliner is bleeding out money, they need something that makes them look good. And the problem is that Starliner has done a lot of stuff that hasn't made them look good. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, um, how it is, cutting off your nose to spite your face in this, but more of a positive way of, or trying to do that in a positive way, um, but ending up screwing up really badly. Uh, but also, I just don't see Boeing dropping Starliner um, simply because of, I don't want to call it corporate ego, um, but, you know, since the 90s, Boeing, since the 90s and the acquisition of McDonnell Douglas, Boeing has just kind of lost its mojo. Um, and to them, doesn't it doesn't matter whether it's going to be losing money at this point. They just want the prestige of having a spacecraft. Because um, they trotted the space shuttle out any time that they could as this delightful Boeing product, even though it was a North American Rockwell product and they just bought the, you know, right. They got the rights with it when the companies purchased each other. Um, but yeah, no, they've, they've already dropped the money into it. So there's no way that Boeing is going to be like, Oh, well, you know, I guess we're just going to fly this five more times and then call it. No, there, there's too much pride uh, in, in those divisions for them to just simply walk away from it like that. I hear you, but pride doesn't make money, right? Like, no, it doesn't. There, there's, 
there's a point where the finite, the bean counters are going to be like, hey, guys, no, we, we can't afford to do this. And, you know, again, let me just reiterate, like that whole division has lost half a billion dollars quarter two this year. Just yeah, this year. And I, I would say that if the bean counters were focused on the Starliner program, then how the heck did Starliner even get past its first flight? Um, mm. So I figure at this point, you know, if if we're still talking about Starliner and flying Starliner, and we've already had one, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to call it like a. Okay, so the first flight we can say first flight Starliner was it was a failure in the objectives, the main objective it was supposed to meet, but many other objectives were passed successfully, and then the second flight finally got what the first flight should have done. I, I'm um, gonna put. Hang on, Jared. I got to push back a little bit. When you're in a test regime and it's a non-operational vehicle, it's hard to call any test in which you get data a failure, I would argue. Yes. Right? Now, if had that been an operational vehicle, absolutely on board. But it is not an operational vehicle yet, right? And they gather data and they, they use that data to actually push the vehicle to the next step. So I, I'm not sure. I have a hard time calling any test regime in which you get data a failure. So, yeah, they got data, but they didn't do their most important test regime, which was rendezvous and docking operations at the space station and seeing how Starliner would would be at the space station when it's docked there and actually working. So to me, that makes it a bit of a – to me, that makes it a, a, a primary objective failure. So there were a lot of tests – you know, on the way and on the way back that worked out like they should have, but really what Starliner was there to do, which was to prove that it could get a crew to the International Space Station safely and uh, and on its own, uh, it didn't really do a fantastic job of that at all. Um, so, I mean, you can't, right out of the gate, mission clock isn't set to the correct time, right? So, like, we're just, what are we, what are we even doing right out of the gate with something like that? So, no, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's that first flight of Starliner is, is mixed to me in terms of how I would describe whether it was a success or a failure. Some, a lot of things worked, but the really big one didn't. Yeah, I, get, I think we're going to fundamentally disagree here in that I don't think, I don't think it's possible to actually have a, a true failure in a test regime unless the only real way in my mind to actually have a failure in a test is to get no data from it whatsoever right like now you've you've really failed right because you lost your vehicle and you have no idea why you lost your vehicle so how do you improve on it right mm -hmm. so yeah. the the thing is when you're testing the whole point of testing is you don't know what you don't know and so yeah you're right they screwed up the time they didn't know that they had done that they didn't like it, it, it was this, you know, if I may equate this to an early, before I worked there, SpaceX launch, right? Falcon 1 Flight 3, I believe it was. Or Flight, yeah, Flight 3, right? The the engine, like, was still, there was still a little bit of thrust off the first stage engines, so the two stages collided with, with each other. It was one line of code that they needed to do to fix that flight. So, yeah, th was, that a, was that flight a failure? In that they did not reach their main test objective. They didn't make it to orbit. That was their main test objective. But they learned exactly what they needed to do to make orbit. So on a non-operational rocket, like, they figured out, oh, hey, we need this to change this one line of code. I would argue that wasn't actually a failure. It was a successful test. Anyhow, yeah. sorry, we're, we're <laughs> going down a rabbit hole here. I'm so sorry. Yeah, but they, I was going to say, but hey, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. No, like... Hey, weren't they carrying a payload on Flight Three, like an actual payload? Um, I don't remember. I I don't remember. Because I want if to they say, were carrying, but... if if they were carrying an actual payload, then that that meant that there was faith in the rocket that it would actually be able to get that payload there. So then, to me, not being able to deliver that payload, that's a failure on it. Uh, I I think I, I don't think that's quite how non-operational rockets work, right? Because when you've got a non-operational rocket, there's always a chance of success, and so sometimes. Some of these fun little companies that do like ashes to space, like send your relatives ashes to space and things like that. Um, they'll sometimes book because you can book it for way, way less money on a flight that has a high probability of not making it to orbit. <laughs> um, Sorry, did you sometimes... say patches? 
Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, exactly. Thanks, Dutta. <laughs> I want the floating Dutta right here. Um, uh, so <laughs> tomorrow, as an example, tomorrow we were able to afford to send our patches. Our in fact, they're right here. They're right here. <laughs> they're literally um, rocket flown patches. It's uh, Exos Aerospace. Oh, you can't see them. These. Wait, wait, wait. These, right here flew in a rocket intended to go to space. And the only way we would be able to afford to fly something like this, fly it to space, is on an experimental spacecraft that, like, they told us out of the gate, they're like, this ain't making it to space. Like, it's highly unlikely we're gonna make it to space. And we're like, it's fun, let's do it, right? So there's, there's a difference in payload. If the payload had, you're right, Jared, if we had expected to get the payload to space and it was like, you know, a full on, not kidding around satellite, that's a very different thing. Well, there were full-on satellites on board of Falcon 1 for Flight 3. There was the Air Force satellite and there were two NASA satellites. Then maybe I'm full of shit. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right, so uh, Dada brought up a comment for us. Uh, From a European perspective, Boeing right now is a failed company in all of its fields. That's a bit aggressive. They are not a national... They, they are not national endeavor, but a cash grabber exploiting weaknesses of an American political system. Maybe around the room. I mean, uh, you can kind of throw the the aircraft program into it, which is a point I was going to bring up. Uh, the, the, the aircraft program, they have many more customers than just NASA, but the 777X was meant to, was meant to be already in operation. You know, the 737 MAX, that had a little bit of a, of a hiccup. And like the 737 MAX 7, I still don't think is flying yet. So, you know, they, they, they're having a lot of hiccups in everything aerospace that they're doing at the moment. The only aircraft they've managed to get off the production line so far is the 737 MAX 8 and MAX 9. Mm. But, but their aircraft division is different than their aerospace division, is it not? Like, aircrafts don't fall under... It's different, but it's the same company. It's under the same name. Sure. Okay. I mean... Yeah. I, I mean, to uh, Jared's point, um, I feel like when the McDonnell Douglas um, management came in, I think they took over most aspects of Boeing, did they not? Including aerospace and... So, like, that feels like the thing that kind of broke them. And, like, when you look at the... So, the, the point of this, like, we, we're, we've veered way off. The, the point of this is how much longer before Boeing calls it quits. Jared, you're saying they won't. You th- or is, was it you that you yeah. you think it's a point of pride and they're yes. not going to call it quits and you know it? Someone else early in the chat room said it was, you know, they were sixty six. Let's see if I can find it because oh, there's a search. But, yeah, that's I saw so that cool too. that I can do that. You yeah. can search for comments in the system. And I just found that comment from way back earlier in like two seconds. Boeing made sixty six billion dollars last year. One billion um, on the sheet yep. for Starline is nothing, right? Like, who cares? Who cares exactly? Okay. Right, so maybe we'll, we'll uh, eat a we'll eat a billion dollars if it gets us good PR. <laughs> yeah, but so, if it gets us good PR, <laughs> the the but the, I just want to add the critical part is that it has to work for you to get good PR, <laughs> and it kind of uh, it, yeah, it's not been doing so good. I mean, at the very least, you need to execute, right? Even if yes. you even if you fail, you've tried and you uh, good job, at a boy. But you have to execute. You can't just not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and something else I'd bring up is Mystic Wolf said 15 minutes ago that NASA will keep throwing money uh, at them because they have too much heritage and they own or uh, there are the United States Congress is a thing that has to be dealt with. And although Boeing is a, you know, is meant to be this new space contract with Star or whatever, Boeing is been a a significant part of the uh, american space program since its inception essentially so you know they asked they are a heritage company that has always been around and you know i guess you could also throw in that they have some they have to do it because government pressure i don't know all right so ryan you say yes they're going to keep going jared you say yes they're going to keep going right that's yeah so now I ask the question to the chat room, whether you're watching live or on demand, what do you think? Do you think they're going to keep going and or is there a cutoff point, right? 
Now, I'm not saying that this would happen, but let's go to the worst case scenario in which two years from now, Starliner still has not flown. They just keep finding issue after issue after issue. Then, do you think that they're going to keep going? Now, let me extend that again. Five years from now, they still haven't gone, right? Like, where? there's a line. There's a line here somewhere. No, there is, right? There's a point in time yeah. where they're just going to go, no. Where, I guess my question is, where is that line? Well, and, and NASA spaceflight has entered the room. Yeah. Scrap it and go Dream Chaser. I think we are all stand for, like, Dream Chaser. Like, I, I yeah. think all of us... From the moment we saw the concept art for Dream Chaser, we were like, that. We all, the world wants that. So, how was, hard are we gonna, how hard are we gonna laugh if Dream Chaser launches before Starliner <laughs> does? Oh, yeah. You know, I'm not gonna laugh. I'm gonna cheer my fool head off. I am beyond excited. Oh, I am, I'm gonna laugh. You can see I'll me laugh. getting giddy on camera. I am I'm, so excited for Dream Chaser. I will laugh maniacally like the, the <laughs> villain I should be at times with this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, that, that would be hilarious if that ends up, if that ends up happening. All right. Uh, I think it's time. We, we've driven this one home. So I'm just curious to know, where does everyone think the line is, right? Because there's a line. So uh, actually, let me ask around the room. Jared, where's the line? Wh when do you think NASA would call it quits? Or do you think 10 years from now, they still haven't flown? They'll keep trying. So the line to me is not specifically an amount of time the, or a predetermined amount of time. The line to me uh, ends up being the ability to pick another established operator, somebody that already has another vehicle that's up and running and able to take over what Starliner would be doing. Because the whole critical key of having Boeing and SpaceX is that you have that redundancy. That way, if a Falcon 9 blows up, because we've had two of them blow up in its history. So regardless of whether, regardless of the fact that it has flown successfully in flight since 2015 and been okay on the pad since 2016, as Dutta once told me, um, you're only good until you're not. Uh, and all it, and it just all it takes is one for things to go wrong. Um, and if something goes wrong, that grounds that rocket, that grounds that spacecraft. And if you only have one, then you have no capability of being able to rotate crews or bring crews back or other things like that. Uh, and that's a really big problem. That's one of those things when people are always saying, just hand it, just hand it to SpaceX, just hand it to Boeing, just hand it to Blue. Well, nobody says just hand it to Blue. Um, but, you know. <laughs> Not, wait, hang on, hang on. Oh, hey, let, can we dive up? <laughs> let, let's pin that because, like, questions about Blue, but continue. Um, but... Uh, no, they absolutely, uh, it will not be a predetermined amount of time. It will be a matter of access. Can we still have access to the International Space Station? If another player comes along and is able to pull that off with a different vehicle, then yes. Uh, but as far as I know, in terms of crew and launching crew to the International Space Station, um, outside of other foreign entities and maybe ones that we're not exactly the most friendly with anymore because of certain good reasons. Um, yeah, turns out I think NASA's just going to basically have to stay that course and be beholden to what Congress wants them to do. Um, and the lawyers who in charge of the money are saying stick with Boeing. So I actually don't see them dropping Boeing at any, any point. In these I, unless there, unless there was some sort of absolutely catastrophic failure um, during a mission, then I could see them chucking Boeing out the window. But but Jared, but you're no, looking at this I, backwards. You're looking at this backwards. You're talking about NASA dropping Boeing. What about Boeing just going? Oh, we're not going to build it. No, because they're going to continue to get they're going to continue to get money regardless of whether this is not a cost plus up. contract. No, this is not a cost plus contract. There there will be. I I just know there's going to be more missions coming on it they're gonna get more but, <laughs> but if they can't so. fly the mission they can't make the money so you could so. give them a you could give them a thousand missions right now they cannot <laughs> they can't execute on those missions right now so neat i don't i just don't see i do not see anybody in this situation stopping so okay. it's just gonna go fair enough your your yeah. vote your vote your vote my vote is, is my vote is never <laughs> never <laughs> All right, it's, all right. It's, it's never. And Ryan, where do you think the line is? Uh, 
while it depends what they want to do with Orbital Reef and private space stations and whatnot, but I feel like the line may be when the ISS is clearly at the end of its lifespan and NASA no longer has a has a desire for it. Boeing may just go, you know what, this was our intended purpose, let's just call it a day. I also think that when Dream Chaser starts knocking around, it may, it may get a little more... Uh, I don't know whether they'll immediately pull it or switch or whatever happens, but uh, the, the pressure will definitely add up, and I feel like the... Um, the likelihood of something happening in the relation of Starliner being cancelled, uh, I feel like that likelihood will increase once Dream Chaser starts um, starts flying. Yeah, I think, and uh, NASA Spaceflight also says, I've, very similar, I think when Dream Chaser, Dream Chaser Cargo starts flying, that could then be incentive for NASA to be like, okay, well, you know, this, re remember, Dream Chaser was designed as a crew vehicle first. And then they kind of retrofitted it to become a cargo vehicle. So um, not to say that there's not still a ton of work that would need to be done to re-retrofit, unretrofit, convert it back to crew. But like, maybe they could do that faster than Boeing can get Starliner going. <laughs> um, well, hey, God, what's that latest comment? Um... I believe the situation UK, in Ukraine gave Starliner a new lease on life since NASA can't 100% rely on Soyuz. Yeah, but again, I so maybe, but that requires that NASA, like maybe Boeing is trying to move this to a cost plus contract? Still can't I fly mean, the vehicle though. Boeing Regardless absolutely... of the political situation, you can't fly the vehicle. But Boeing absolutely has the political chops to be able to pull it off. I could, it, it would be, I don't want to say it would be a piece of cake for Boeing to come in and convince send, convince the right people, senators and otherwise, uh, to turn their contract into a cost plus one. But I mean, they're Boeing. They got tons of money. They can, they can yield that in, in, in the influence that they want. So, yeah. And I, I think this is a very valid point from, uh, Northern Chev contract or not Boeing will be given more will be given stress will be given more money right yeah i think a lot of people forget that there's a major political aspect in a lot of in, in space flight like it's a it's a critical key to making sure that your company survives in aerospace is having a good good understanding of the the, the field of political play uh let's see hang on there was a Oh, I missed the original comment. Uh, oh, here we go. Bennett says, aren't Dream Chaser crew and cargo two very different vehicles? And NASA Spaceflight says, just add windows and life support. <laughs> yeah, piece of cake. Oh, no, my God. No, no, no. They, they developed uh, crew first. So for the cargo, they just removed the windows and the life support. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Just put them back. Just put them back. All right. Uh, and then there's this constant, like, I don't, I'm pretty sure Ryan started it somehow, like, off to the side, but there's this whole Aries 1X debate going on in the chat room as well. Uh, so that's, I, 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 I don't know how. Nothing. They're going off by themselves. I mean, I, I can't control them. I can't, I can't, I can't control them being, being correct that Aries 1X. Oh, 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 right, right. Was, cor is correct the word you were looking for? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> quickly quickly moving on i will just add that on that point with um soyuz nasa still wants to put an american on soyuz in september laurel o'hara will be flying on ms24 soyuz ms24 so you know the political situation isn't great right now between the west and russia let's put it that way however yeah. nasa still nasa as an agency still wants to put americans on soyuz for the re purposes of redundancy. Whether you agree with that or not, that is something they want to do. And both Cosmos are putting their cosmonauts on SpaceX crew vehicles on NASA commercial crew missions. So whether you agree with it or not, it is still happening. Yeah, I mean, fair data, fair data. But then, that, that, I mean, that, ex <laughs> yeah. We could, I, I feel like we could just go on for an hour round in circles on this particular topic, right? Cause like, there is no right answer. We don't know, we don't know the contracts and there's a whole bunch of politics at play here. All that other fun jazz. And also, yeah. who's to say that, like, by the end of this year, they won't fly, right? And once they once they can fly humans and they've got these things worked out, like, you, you should be, uh, barring unexpected issues, you, this becomes an operational vehicle at that point. They can just start sending crews to station, and they've got guaranteed contracts for sending crews to station. So this thing just starts making money from that moment forward. And to Ryan's point earlier, 
Like, it doesn't just have to be making money with NASA on cruise to space station. They There are alternate projects in which they can use this as a profit center for Boeing. So I don't, I'm not sure it actually makes sense for them to cancel anything at this juncture. I think my, I, where I was just going mentally is like, okay, but and as I mentioned, like, there's a line somewhere where they're like, no, we're not going to do this anymore. And I'm, I'm just like, I wonder how close to that line they are right now. I, yeah, I, I, none of us can know, but like, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Jared. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I was just going to kind of piggyback on the idea of the fact that you don't necessarily have to have like an established customer or something with that. I mean, uh, Sierra Nevada was was actually like seriously working with the United Nations Office of Outer Space in order to have uh, in order to actually fly a mission for the United Nations. Um, So like you don't necessarily have to work with traditional groups in order to have a mission flown on a Starliner. Right. I mean, SpaceX is a great example of that, right? With Inspiration4. That's, that was definitely not a traditional group of, of people mm-hmm. flying a spacecraft, right? Um, I would even reckon the Axiom missions in terms of, uh, oh, we're pushing it. No, no, no. This It updates oh, okay. once an hour. Uh, oh, this one I says, we don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. Oh, little Bob Ross. We got a little Bob oh. Ross in the show. Yeah. Hey, how, how relevant. Maybe, that, maybe that's a quote from Boeing. <laughs> It's Starliner's certainly, a happy accident. Certainly is now. All right, why don't we? Uh, why don't we? I, I put a pin in Blue Origin, but I think before we come back to Blue Origin, let's talk about um, Falcon Heavy. Like the part of the reason I had to cancel last week's show is because I was uh, I was knee deep in uh, working on some control room upgrades that were not going well, and so we had been working uh, for the last two weeks, day and night, weekends, just constantly straight trying to get that primary video control room back online, which we did. You'll note that. Like Falcon Heavy webcast? Yeah, exactly. So on that note, um, I'll turn it over to Jared and Ryan and do this. <laughs> Brilliant. So Falcon Heavy launched again, finally. I want it to launch more than it does. It's been launching a lot compared to like 2020, but you know, still lovely to see. So Echo Star 24 was launched on Falcon Heavy. It's the heaviest commercial satellite ever to be taken to geo. Nine metric tons, which is just a mind-boggling weight to think about, especially for a commercial satellite. And because of that, originally, we were going to get a double drone ship uh, landing for the first time, which I'm sure all the fleet uh, lovers would have loved to see. I'm still not sure how close the drone ships would actually be and whether we'd be able to see them landing side by side or anything like that. Uh... But unfortunately, due to the immense number of Starlink launches that are going up, the fleet was busy. So they took a little bit of performance out of the um, first stage and then returned to the launch site. And, you know, it's just a, uh, it was a kind of cloudy, but it allowed us to get a wonderful look at the um, a wonderful look at the, the, the flame coming out the bottom of the vehicle there as it ascended up into space. And, um, yeah, it's just for it's such a. Uh, it's such a unique vehicle with the ability to take all three cores back down. It's just, you know, Falcon 9 is a cool rocket. Falcon Heavy just adds that little bit of extra spice on top. Jared, I'm not sure what you thought of this flight. Uh, I am always uh, always in love with really big rockets and also, like, uh, if, uh, brute force solutions to things. So strapping three cores together. And I know, I know it's a lot more complicated than just strapping three rockets together. So don't, I don't... You guys in the comments don't have to tell me that. Um, but things like that and having witnessed heavy launches before here on the West Coast with Delta IV Heavy. Um, <laughs> hurry up, SpaceX. <laughs> CLE set for Falcon Heavy here on the West Coast. <laughs> Never forgiving you for not doing the Falcon Heavy test flight from Vandenberg like you said you would. <laughs> um, yeah, it was fantastic. And I absolutely love booster separation at night because you get that interaction between the exhaust plumes of yeah. the center core with the center core throttling up and then the boosters coming off and beginning their boost back. And I, having seen a jellyfish, a SpaceX space jellyfish in person, uh, they are absolutely amazing to witness. And it just, it's just mind blowing to see that every time, like that shot right there was just absolutely stunning. So I have no idea how, who, or who could have helped make a shot like that happen. 
Um, but it was, it was just, oh man, it was so good with that there. I also think uh, that the interesting thing is that there has been some small evolution um, with Falcon Heavy, um, yeah, which is also translated to some of the Falcon 9 missions as well, like the Great Stripe. In order, if I recall, the Great Stripe is there to keep the RP-1 warm um, during these long coast phases. Um, there's a Grey Stripe on the second stage, if I'm recalling yeah. It's all for thermal management, for the, like the yeah. five-hour coast missions. That it yep. just gives them more, just gives them more options. Yeah, and I think that really that kind of adds some flavor and some character to the launch vehicle as well, because you get to see them in ways they look different. You get to end up. You could tell what it's going to be doing based upon how it looks. Um, it kind of it starts to remind me of of back in the day, like the the late aughts, the early twenty tens, when uh, the NRO launches were happening, and we were and people were trying to guess what they were. So you would look at the rocket configuration, you look at the how many boosters is it launching, which uh, payload fairing is it launching with? Is it the four point two or five point four or uh, you know things like that? Um, and it's just really. I don't, there's just so much going on in a Falcon Heavy launch that I really, yeah. really like it. It's not, it's not, you know, I love the Delta IV Heavy. Any rocket that lights itself on fire in order to actually work is an amazing thing. <laughs> um, but, uh, oh my gosh, the double booster landing. That was so cool. That was, so what was so cool, I loved on the SpaceX broadcast that one of the boosters, you could see the booster landing from the camera on the booster. And that just like blew my mind because I was like, yeah, that's what's happening. And then that shot right there in the upper right corner, that was a perfect shot. Just mm -hmm. like watching one booster come down and land. And then a couple seconds later, here comes the second booster come down and land. And just like great. And then this shot, this one I was excited to see again as well because I feel like they just don't show everyone at Hawthorne enough anymore. Like those are the folks that make the rocket. Those are mm -hmm. those are the important folks. So I wish that there would be more of the Hawthorne views um, with that. So I got I was super excited that we actually got that 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 couple seconds of acknowledgement for the folks yeah, uh, that work behind the scenes to make all of this happen. And I wish I wish there was a lot more focus on that. But I mean, you know, I'm just I'm just happy to watch the big rocket go up and do what it was supposed to do. Yeah, and I don't have the tweet pulled up, but there's also there was also a, a tweet from uh, NASA Marshall, maybe I forgot, but one NASA account um, with the new longer Falcon fairing coming into yes. the um, uh, uh, vacuum chamber for testing, and this is going to be needed for um, space force missions and uh, gateway missions and things like that. So the the long fairing is real; it's in testing, and it's going to be uh, launching at some point. Um, over the next few years, fingers crossed, and um, yeah, we'll definitely know we'll, uh, kind of what size of payload will be inside when they have that brand new longer <laughs> fairing on top. I mean, if you thought the fairing was already long, it's going to might look a little bit more lopsided with the massive tall fairing on top of the vehicle. Yeah, in fact, I've got it uh, here. If you want to take a look at it, it's from the NASA Launch Services Provider, or NASA underscore LSP, um, where they've got uh, that long fairing, and they're doing what they call shielding effectiveness testing. So basically, they're figuring out uh, frequencies from radio and other stuff, making sure that the payload fairing does a good job in uh, not messing that up. And they got a really big chamber where they test all of that in because it has to fit inside of that. Um, but yeah, that was that was going on at NASA Glenn. Um, so very very exciting to see that. That's right, everybody. The SpaceX long fairing is real, and it's going to carry your really big payloads for you. Um, which I imagine there's a lot of people at the National Reconnaissance Office who are very happy right now. Yeah, and um, I also move on to something just to keep Jamie quiet for a little bit longer. Let's talk about <laughs> Starship. Um, because the other day we got this uh, full power test of the deluge system, the new steel plane, which is apparently meant to solve everyone's problems. I mean, this slow-mo shot just looks absolutely kind of mesmerizing. The water just kind of just appears out of nowhere, and it's so powerful, and you can really yeah. see there. That should that's that's going to apparently stop 
the booster from ripping concrete up and, uh, I don't know, throwing it at vans or something like that. So, <laughs> yeah, this was really exciting to see and also really loud. The loud part wasn't from the water coming out of the plate. The loud part was from the, the tank farm um, of the... Um, of the of the water getting pushed through because this is this this may look just like oh it's like a sprinkler at the water park but it isn't this is huge this is a huge deluge system and it really you can see there over on the left it's reaching several levels up on the tower and on the right it's going over the berm into the tank farm this this water and nitrogen mix is just going everywhere which is the idea you want to be able to absorb as much energy as possible from the from the bottom of the booster um, but yeah it's um, Really cool to see this, because this should, fingers crossed, make the turnaround time from flight two to flight three even shorter. Because a lot of the, a lot of the research and development that uh, could have gone into, you know, <laughs> fixing the problems from the flight of flight one, has had to go into fixing the pad from flight one. Because the vehicle was reusable, or was designed to be reusable, but the pad most certainly wasn't. It had a lot of research and development that had to go in to fix this pad. And Jared, you said potentially kind of i think it was kind of tongue-in-cheek but you think worst case scenario boca might even be toast after that first flight our first uh, the first uh, <laughs> show back after the flight you said it could be toast and it was clearly not toast yeah well thankfully it's not and and as i will frequently know i am always happy uh to both be publicly proven wrong and acknowledge that i'm wrong about things publicly as well so very much i was wrong about about spacex potentially saying no we're done with boca we're just going to move on to florida so uh, i guess we'll get some more flights out of that and i do want to also put myself back on the line here because in looking at the deluge system uh it's definitely better than say concrete sitting underneath the yeah. pad. And, and so I, I want to preface it by saying that it is, it is a significant improvement and better than nothing. Um, and I am excited to see whether it is going to work or not. But I'm also trying to keep a very healthy skepticism about it because it is a bit different from other pad deluge systems that have been used before. Um, most pad, I mean, every pad deluge system that I've ever seen, the deluge is not coming from underneath the rocket. It's coming from the side of the rocket areas mm -hmm. where the exhaust will not be immediately impinging or, or pressing into the area where the, the, the water for thermal and acoustical dampening is coming from. Um, this is the first time I've, first time I can think of a water deluge system uh, actually coming in from where that, exhaust where extreme temperatures and pressures are going to be occurring at. Um, so I'm, I, if anybody can do their homework, there's two groups that I can think of who I will always say, if anybody can do their homework with, and it's JPL and SpaceX. Um, so if anybody can get it right, I'm sure SpaceX can, but at the same time, I also don't know if, if, you know, uh, the, the old uh, Richard Feynman line, which is uh, for nature cannot be fooled. So we have to make sure that, that this actually sort of works in the realm of things like, you know, physics and other stuff like that. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, really excited about this because like if you, flight one had a lot of unknowns for Starship and now flight two is also going to have like, it feels like even more unknowns for me because of things like pad deluge and other stuff like that. So, um, so overall, I'm really excited about it. Uh, I want it to work obviously. Um, but also at the same time, I, I am reminding myself that, that these are really actually genuinely new engineering solutions. So we'll get to see whether it's going to work or not. Um, and if, if, I, wrongs if I, if i'm wrong i'm wrong and i'm always happy to yeah. admit i'm wrong and chris brings up a good point which we're also going to get hot staging which is another thing that is in my opinion more realistic than doing a 360 degree flip to yeet the starship off the booster but it's also a bit of an I, unknown i hadn't even heard of the 360 degree flip until after the test flight like I didn't I didn't realize that was the thing. And when I heard about when I heard about it for the first time, it literally I was literally like, what? Like that sounds like sounds like Starship like that that sounds like an excuse to make it like, oh yeah, <laughs> it was supposed to fly that way. Y yeah, yeah. But actually I guess it was actually supposed to fly that way. Yeah. Um with it. So yeah. 
<laughs> and GTH is asking, do we think that they'll static fire with the deluge? I mean, I certainly think so. That's the yes. point of the deluge system. They need the data from it, so they can kill off two birds with one stone. Static fire the booster, test your deluge system, or mix it together in the middle to hopefully not have concrete flying everywhere. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh... And also, there was a comment earlier. Uh, where did it go? Uh, Bennett asking, was it pieces of the pad or pieces of Starship that prompted the ecological complaint? Because avoiding that would have been great for both the area and the schedule. And I think you're referring to the, the potential lawsuit or lawsuit that's currently going on. I haven't like looked into it in depth. I'm not a lawyer. But from what I've seen, it seems like there's a lot of kind of complaints being brought up that uh, either don't have any foundation or just kind of pointless or useless or just... It seems... Um, at least in my opinion, it seems kind of uh, stupid to try and prevent them from doing any more research and development because, okay, if you don't like the fact that concrete went everywhere, they've tried to build a solution for it. If you're not going to let them test the solution, how do you know it's not going to happen again? So that's yeah. my opinion on it anyways. To me, uh, I, I also don't have an opinion on it either simply because I don't have enough information. Um, I haven't looked into it too much. One of the really difficult problems I have found in trying to read up about SpaceX and the environmental stuff um, going on down in Boca Chica uh, is that it often seems that whoever is the news provider uh, of it will also inject their bias into it pretty pretty tough uh, or pretty viciously. Um, so you'll you'll find something either with like a si significant environmentalist slant or something with a significant SpaceX slant. And it's really mm -hmm. like, that's just not what I, like, I don't really want to read that. I want to kind of know what is going on uh, just straight up. Like I'm not interested in, in developing the bias and it's, I just have not, it's been, I have not found anything or anyone covering it that has not ha injected a tremendous amount of bias into their coverage for it so it's just mm -hmm. ah, i wish there was some, something that would just cover it like like uh nasa's nasa space flight you guys should like to get a uh, environmental lawyer or something and, and work together i don't know so well as chris says so there, there are many holes in the lawsuit basic fact errors and yeah it seem it kind of at least in my opinion if if there if there are basic facts that are that are incorrect it seems kind of like what's the point is there even any kind of challenge might be a boring I mean, vid <laughs> yeah like say that no it wasn't so you get people like me to watch it so. <laughs> <laughs> and hoopable uh said uh, no one sued Aries one x um, that's true so just yet uh, yet another, another yeah, let's uh, let's w chalk for another Aries one, one X. for Aries One X right there. Aries One so. X, yeah. <laughs> and just back. Very, yep. As I was about to say, I think I think that pretty much covers our SpaceX discussion for this week. Yeah, yeah. I felt like you guys and, uh, were starting to stall. Yeah. <laughs> well, saying that Aries One stall. X, just stall. just spitting stall. facts stall. about Aries One X. Yeah, so, as soon as you yeah. start talking Aries One X, yeah. I, I have to jump in and be like, yeah, no, 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 no. All right, I think, uh, uh, oh, Jared, we didn't do your story. So I was like, that's the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, thanks for that uh, going on there. I appreciate, I... <laughs> Sorry, just... What you got this week for us, Jared? Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about our friends down in New Zealand, Rocket Lab, uh, because they're busy, right? They're, they're doing their own thing with their own rocket. Electron, and they're also trying to do what I think is a good thing, which is set up their rockets to be uh, essentially reusable. So, um, so they just on their most recent launch, baby, come back home, uh, named so because they are working to get their first stages of Electron back home. So that way they can bring them back in, get them ready to fly again, and then fly them. Uh, and of course, this is uh, this is how tomorrow won one of our our multiple bets that we have made with Peter Beck um, at Rocket Lab. So um, so if you want to look into that, that's sort of uh, tomorrow ancient history. But it is uh, I, it's got to be in one of our shows where we're well, well, got, actually I've got two, Jared. I've got two. I got two here. The first one was um, they're absolutely going to actually there are three uh, tomorrow versus Rocket Labs on this one for bets. <laughs> The first one was um, they're absolutely going to go for reusability. 
The second one was once they announced reusability and they were going to use helicopters, it was, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, it ain't going to work. Because, like, everyone tries it. Everyone thinks it's a good idea and it never works. So, like, that was number two. And then number three is flying um, meat bags into space. I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, they'll, they'll eventually start flying crew. So those are the three. Those were I the think, three. I think there's four. They, they said they weren't going to go after a bigger rocket as well. Oh, that's right. That's right. And yeah. they did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the direct quote from Peter Beck was, marine assets suck. And now their entire reusability <laughs> plan for electron and neutron is to use marine assets. <laughs> So, I mean, like, it's the, it's the biggest U-turn of them all. <laughs> the thing, well, so first off, a couple of notes. Uh, being able to go, oh, hey, just kidding, wrong, we're going to do that, uh, is a sign of, a, I think, a very powerful, good leader, right? Because mm-hmm. you yes. got to be willing to go, yeah, no, the, the data is showing somewhere else. Second, he's not wrong. Marine assets suck. <laughs> 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 like, they really, they're really expensive and they're hard to maintain and the ocean wants to eat everything, right? Like... Marine assets do suck, but also trying to catch helicopters with, uh, trying to catch helicopters, trying to catch rockets with helicopters also kind of sucks. It's not, it's not. I think I have a solution there. What mm-hmm. if you put wings on it and brought it back to land? <laughs> well, that, and that's another one where you remember, oh, I can't, I can't, but remember, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else has to extrapolate Ryan's comment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm not even going to touch it, but yeah, uh, just, you know, they're steadily making progress towards reusability, which is great. Um, That is, I have, I felt like, you know, like you seriously are either developing reusability or you're just not. Uh, And Bennett's bringing up a good point, which is trying to catch helicopters with rockets would be something to see. (laughs) Thanks, Bennett. I would would pay a lot of money to see that. Um, That would definitely be entertaining. Um, but it was just also really cool that Rocket Lab like actually put this video out for everybody to take a look at in case you like have ever wondered what does it look like to be a, a stage coming back. You know, that's that sort of like through the yeah. top cam um, that they have there. And uh, yeah. yeah, it was it was just really, really cool. And I appreciate the transparency that Rocket Lab is doing mm-hmm. with this. They're very, they're definitely not hiding anything they're showing that this is a really difficult thing to pull off and yeah it is <laughs> it's there's, there's really no easy way to do this but it is a wait wait hang on are we what are we looking at here is that the drogue that like that's the initial drug right yeah, that's, yeah. Looking, okay. oh, that's the drug through the interstage looking up towards the sky that's the drogue of the of the parachute uh-huh. is that is that but that looks like a line that's also twisted is that am i not understanding correctly like what's that li- uh, flappy line? I think that might that be a backup line. line. Uh, yeah, I think that flappy line may also be a part of the deployment system. So it's one of those that I imagine would probably rip itself or something like that. Um, so it's probably, uh, you know, obviously we we're just speculating as to what it is, but yeah, I don't I don't think it actually has anything to do with the the yeah, uh, actual the parachute itself. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty good, taking, actually. Taking yeah. a little bit of time briefing there. And then there but we they go. Always... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they got there, right? Like, look, they got there. Yeah, and that's good. Parachutes are hard. So in case <laughs> yeah. anybody wanted to know, they are really difficult. <laughs> Parachutes are I mean, gorgeous when they work. Oh, they really are. You're, you're not, like, there's something just majestic about them because, like, You just got this object, they just kind of like float and kind of like subtly collide into each other and kind of, I don't know, there's something about the, Mm -hmm. they're just majestic. Absolutely, Donna. Yeah. And I also read someone's, go on, Jared. Oh yeah, I was just going to say, like, it's it's great to see them and they're, the physics of parachutes is is ridiculous, so. (laughs) Yeah. I was just going to say, someone whose job it is to work in space work media, I absolutely adore the amount of stuff that Rocket Lab provide, they, unlike a certain aerospace company with an X in its name, they regularly update their Flickr with not only photos, but also some wonderful clean feed videos, which are really nice to use on whatever content we make. So, you know, I, I have no facts here, but I have a feeling that a certain aerospace company with an X in its name 
stopped using its Flickr as soon as a certain CEO bought another social media platform. But I have no facts to back that up. It's just, maybe it's just a wild coincidence. But there you go. My opinions are on the table. That's what that I've got. That parachute's pretty. Look at it go. Oh, spinny time. It's cool. It's the only other, <laughs> only other notes, because, uh, you know, adding on to Jared's um, rock, Rocket Laboratory story, uh, keep in mind, they did just try to do, I believe it was their 40th launch of an Electron. Um, mm -hmm. This was yesterday or the day before. And uh, there was a rare... Uh, what is now a rare uh, rocket lab abort. Like the engines fired at, and then at like T minus two seconds, hard cutoff, um, which also like it's just uh, is kind of showing the systems working, right? So that's, you know, it's kind of one of those like if you're, uh, you know, outside of aerospace looking in, you can look at that and be like, oh, they failed their launch. It's like, no, 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 no. They stopped because like they, they detected a problem and that's what's supposed to happen. And it's, it's yeah. just, it was kind of weird. I haven't seen Electron, like, abort on the pad in a really long time. I thought it was, mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Lewis is saying 30. I thought it was the 40th launch. 4-0, yeah, is it, it not? Was, it, was, it was the 40th. And Peter yeah. Beck tweeted shortly after saying that a low igniter pressure on one engine, it did not pass its go test, and an auto abort was called. It's not uncommon to see low pressures now and again. Just have to, just haven't seen it to lead to an abort for a while. My bet is a tricky pressure transducer. The team will sort it quickly. Yeah, so, good, yeah. like... Good on them. So, you know. also, I will say, like, uh, at the pad abort, just like the calmness of the launch control room, um, where it's just like, yep, we aborted T minus two seconds. Uh, all pad operators move to whatever, I don't know what their nomenclature is at Rocket Lab. Um, it was just very smooth and crisp and understood and well rehearsed. It was like they, they've kind of come into their own, right? It, you could tell there wasn't really panic or chaos, at least not in the voice of that particular uh, controller. It was just like, Yep, here we are. This is what we need to do now. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it just not to say they're growing up because like I feel like that's not really fair to the company, but clearly like they've definitely got their operations in order. At least that's how it felt from the outside looking in. Yeah, I, I, people always complain about scrubs, but scrubs are just a sign that this is a, a company that knows what they're doing. So if you can catch your yeah. problem and prevent it from happening in the air, in, if, if, if your problems are happening on the ground and not in the air, then you seem to be doing something right. So, Well, everyone, this was a fun and delightful show. I was glad to be back. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I'll talk as much as I can talk about why we were off last week. And um, I also want to thank all of the uh, citizens of tomorrow who helped to make these shows go. And if you are a citizen of tomorrow, we're about to go into our uh, members only show right after this one. So uh, make sure that you go over and check out the uh, the link uh, that shows you uh, like in, in the chat or I'm sorry, go to YouTube and then ch click on the link for the member show. It will take us a minute or two to actually get into the show. And earlier today during this show, I put a pin in Blue Origin and I was like, we'll loop back around to that and we will in the member show. Uh, so if, uh, I think I want to talk a little bit wow. about like, right, exactly, see what I did there? I want to talk a little bit about like how, because we were really beating on Boeing here, but like what has Blue Origin brought to the table? And you know, if we're going to be talking about Blue Origin, I feel like Dream Chaser is also another really great thing to be chatting about. Uh, so that, th those two items, and then as much as I'm allowed or as much as I, I can, um, I'll talk a little bit about why we were off last week and like what I've been working on at Company X. I can't go into extreme detail, but like I can I can give a few hints and whatnot. So uh, thank you all so much for watching. That is our show this week. Uh, I'm excited to join you. Uh, oh, wait, uh, I will be in New York next week. So this will be an interesting one. Uh, so New thank York, you all. folks. New York. Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, what are you doing here? Hey. <laughs> are you going to the hotel again? You're going to look at the planes and have a drink while you're doing it? Hey. I am not going to the TWA hotel this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, you know what? I'll Look also tell you about, <laughs> wow. I do love that TWA hotel. I was why we got, is why I got the vest of boards. Yeah. All right. We'll talk about my New York trip as well in the, uh, in the members only show. If you'd like to become a member, uh, youtube.com slash TMRO slash member. I think, I don't know. It was in the slides. You slash saw join. <laughs> slash join. Slash, slash join. join. Something like slash, slash join. join. Thank you. Right. Join button. Join button. Hit the join okay. button. Bye, Bye. Hit the join button. Thank you so much. See you next week. Bye.